let's talk about digital cameras. Very handy, very simple to use, but that's because they're very complex systems with a lot of computing power, a lot of software, and a lot of science behind them. Let's start at the beginning, up at the business end. A digital camera is much like any other optical system. Light falls on the subject and is reflected into an optical system. The lenses focus the light onto the image sensor. Cameras use two mechanisms to control the amount of light that falls on the image sensor for a given exposure. The aperture, varying the size of the aperture, varies the amount of light, and the shutter, Varying the amount of time that the shutter is open varies the amount of light. Modern image sensors are made of pixels. We'll talk more about pixels in a moment, and in particular, we'll talk more about that arrangement of colors of pixels. The architecture of the hardware of a digital camera looks something like this. We have the image sensor. We have an image processing unit that performs early stage operations. We have unit to do image compression, a separate unit to do video compression. A host processor manages the system, runs the display, and manages the storage in which we store the results of image capture and compression. The difference between still image and video capture that was so prominent in the film era is much less so in modern cameras. Most digital cameras combine some features of image and video capture. Different cameras may use different physical sizes of image sensors, and the size of the image sensor can have a profound effect on the characteristics of the captured image. To give you a relative idea of the sizes, here's a medium format sensor, full frame 35 millimeter, APS-C, smartphone. Modern image sensors are manufactured on silicon wafers using the same basic technology that's used to form other types of integrated circuits such as computers. This is a cross section. We can see the photo sensor here in addition, there's also other circuitry surrounding the photo sensor to make the pixel. Above, we see a color filter. And on top, a micro lens. The micro lens focuses light through the color filter onto the photo sensor. Part of its job is to avoid illuminating that other circuitry that can't actually capture light. Different pixels are given different colors of filters. We create color images by combining several different colors. The most common configuration of colors is known as the Bayer pattern after its inventor at Kodak. We see we have two greens, one red, and one blue. Given a two by two array, the choice of two greens is made because the human visual system is most sensitive to green. We can fill out the pattern a little bit to see how we can interpolate in order to fill in the colors that are missing at any given point. For example, we can take these four greens to estimate the green value at this location. Similarly, we can take these two reds to estimate the red at that position. This fabric allows us to illustrate the effects of using a pattern of different colors of filters in order to capture a full color image. Remember that we've estimated some of the colors at different pixels because we can't record all of the colors at once. This photo of this fabric was taken with a traditional Bayer pattern filter. This image was made with a camera that can shift the image sensor to capture all three primary colors at every location. This image shows us that in fact the fabric has a small number of blue fibers. In this image, because we're capturing all three primaries at each location, the blue stands out more clearly. In the previous picture, the color filter array doesn't sample often enough to be able to reliably estimate the color of those occasional blue threads. 
The result is that the fabric appears to be different colors when photographed with different cameras. This flower image, like all our other images, is organized as a regular array of pixels. If we reduce the number of pixels in the image, making each pixel cover a larger area, we see that the image becomes less distinct. The pixel pitch is measured on the image sensor itself. It is the distance between adjacent pixels. One way to characterize this change in resolution is using root mean squared error. And a simple formula shows us the relationship between the pixel pitch and that RMS error. Pixelation is just one of the factors that helps determine image quality. Another is the electronic noise in the photo sensor. This graph shows that in fact there's a trade-off between these two properties. As the pixel pitch becomes larger and we have fewer pixels in the image, the pixelation noise increases. But as the pixel pitch becomes larger, the photo sensor electronic noise actually decreases. There is in fact a Goldilocks point at which the pixel is not too large, not too small, just right to maximize image quality. When we take a picture, we hear that click. But in fact, a lot of things need to happen before the click and a lot of things need to happen after in order to give us a usable image. Oh, and by the way, in a lot of inexpensive cameras, that sound is actually a recording of a mechanical shutter. Nothing real. Pre-capture, we need to set the exposure, the white balance, and the focus. Post-capture, we need to adjust for the bear pattern, we need to compress the image or video, and we need to store it. This graph shows the relationship between exposure, the amount of light that falls on a pixel, and the value of that pixel. At very low illumination levels, the pixel records dark. At very high illumination levels, the pixel records white, independent of what color that pixel actually should be. The job of exposure is to ensure that the interesting parts of the image are captured in the middle of that curve, not too dark, not too light. The choice of aperture and shutter speed has a lot to do with how the final image actually looks. Many sources of light actually have color. Our visual system in the real world adjusts for the changes in the color of the light that is falling on the scene. When we record an image, the brain can no longer adjust, so the camera has to do it for you. The standard assumption for choosing white balance is the gray world assumption, that the entire scene averages out to gray. This is an example of an image that defeats that gray world assumption. Most of the image is these yellow bricks. There are a small number of gray stones underneath, but overall the yellow dominates the scene, and so the white balance algorithm can't figure out an appropriate color for the overall scene. Several different mechanisms are used in different cameras to choose how to focus. Some of them are active, such as infrared systems that bounce an infrared light off the subject. Others are passive, such as this rangefinder style system. Many cameras also provide shake reduction systems. Once again, several different mechanisms are in use. Some use mechanical components in the optics that move. Others use micromechanical systems to move the image sensor itself in small increments. Yet others use image processing to choose how to crop to get a slightly smaller image that is properly centered. Compression is a key technology for multimedia systems. Lossy compression systems are critical to getting file sizes that we can actually manage. We use separate but related mechanisms to compress still images and video. Image and video compression algorithms perform lossy compression. They throw away information in the image or video. They do it in a way that minimizes the effect on the perception of that image or that video. 
The standard for image compression is JPEG. Most JPEG compressors give you a control that allows you to trade off image quality for file size. Higher quality means larger files. Lower quality means smaller files. Here's an example of an image compressed at higher quality. Here's the same image compressed at lower quality. This image shows the difference between the two. You can see that many of the pixels are substantially different. JPEG manages the relationship between quality and size using the discrete cosine transform, or DCT. This is a mathematical operation that turns pixels into spatial frequency intensities. Managing that relationship is much easier in the spatial frequency domain than it is in the pixel domain. Video compression takes advantage of the discrete cosine transform, but it needs even more techniques in order to reduce the vastly larger amount of data in videos. Luckily, videos often don't change that much from frame to frame. So block motion estimation can be used to find the relationship between one frame and the next. Here's an image of birds flying. And here is another image of those same birds a moment later. If we go back to the original frame, we can select a region and then try to find that region or something very close in the successive frame. So we pick a search region that we're going to test and we compare at different positions in order to find a good match. Many different data standards are used in image and video storage. TIFF, for example, is typically used for lossless compression. So we mentioned JPEG is the standard for image compression. JFIF is actually the format of the particular file that is used to record that JPEG data. Raw image formats are often proprietary. Raw image formats are generally proprietary and usually contain raw image sensor data, although in some cases that raw file really isn't raw. MPEG-4, H.264 are widely used video formats. But there are other formats as well. For example, EXIF defines the metadata that's used to supplement the image data. The DCF standard describes the relationship between storage media, writers, and readers. And those are only just a few of the possible image formats. In summary, digital cameras are in some ways like any other camera, but they have sophisticated processing systems in there that perform a variety of image processing, compression, and computer management operations, creating a useful image from a silicon sensor requires imaging science and computer science.